Okay, I see it is just one minute after quarter past. So welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any other questions or queries, please feel free to reach out to us at webinars at sscafrica.org.za and we'll get back to you or do our best to put you in touch with the relevant speakers um, that you may have seen. I'm going to stop sharing now and hand over to Dale Clayton, who's joining us from Swakops Conservancy. Um, so Dale, do you want to bring up your slides in the meantime? Yes. Uh, wonderful. Okay. Perfect. So uh, Swakops Conservancy is a local um, organization based here in Klebecha um, that's been in operation for, for quite a while. So we're very excited to hear about all the various various things that, that they do, and some of the amazing work and amazing amounts of waste that they've been collecting. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Dale Clayton. I'm officially the uh, operations manager of the SWAT Club Conservancy. I was brought in as chairman uh, last year at the uh, AGM, but uh, employees can't be chairman of a conservancy, so I'm officially the operations manager. Um, and a little bit of background about the Swatkops Conservancy started in 1969 uh, by a group of very cranky people in the in the Amsterdam Hook area, the old um, area of Amsterdam Hook, who protested against the uh, erection of the Fishwater Flats Waste Treatment Works, uh, where it's presently cited. Um, they argued that it should be built down towards Humewood Summer Strand Way, um, where there were a lot of Jewish people residing, and. Uh, to cut a long story short, we lost the battle and the waste treatment works were erected in uh, where they are now, for top end of deal party. Uh, so we've been, we've been operating since 1969, uh, more as a watchdog, but we've, we've found that in the last 30 years, we had to be, become more hands-on and proactive. Um, and as the plastic deluge hit us, we had to become very much more proactive uh, to the point that about 10, 12 years ago, uh, we had to actually start picking up plastic out of the estuary because we were being swamped. It was coming out the river onto the Blue Water Bay beach. Uh, I can vouch for that. I used to pick it up on the beach as well. So we changed tactics. And for the last 10, 12 years, and I've been running it for the last six or seven, uh, we pick up plastic at source or as high up as we can in the stormwater canal along the estuary banks uh, to stop it getting into the mainstream and actually going out to sea and polluting the river. Um, there's a lot of other things that the Swatkops Conservancy does, um, apart from collecting plastic. Uh, 30 years ago, Jenny Rump and uh, Dr. Paul Martin started an education program amongst the local township schools mainly uh, to try and uh, improve uh, knowledge about plastics and uh, it's working. There's little green patches here and there, but it's there, it's really a, an uphill battle um, to understand why people uh, discard plastic and throw plastic um, is beyond the scope of this discussion now. But it's it's a it's a challenge that we're not giving up on. In fact, my co-worker partner Jenny Rump is having uh, a lesson on the banks right now with their school. We normally have 70 pupils. We bust them in. Uh, take them out to the estuary to learn about the birds and the bees and the fish and everything else and the crab. In in winter time, we go into the um, Adon Nature Reserve or the Swatkops Nature Reserve, and you learn about the trees and animals. Um, we also teach them about plastic pollution and what not to do. Don't throw it away. Pick it up. Put it in your pocket. Take it home with you. Um, we hope that it's making some difference. Um, we do a lot of, uh, as much as we can, uh, recycling. We collect recycling uh, all around uh, Motherwell Township and in Blue Water Bay and in Amsterdam Oak and in Swatkops and in Red House. And we take it to our recycling center where it gets sorted properly and then uh, sold off at Cannibal or wherever, wherever the, uh, uh, whichever place is, has the best prices. Uh, we also look after the uh, nature reserves there, Ella Nature Reserve. Um, we have regular snails at least once every three months in the Ella Reserve and in the Swatkops Nature Reserve. We do trail widening. Um, and lately we've been concentrating on alien vegetation removal. Uh, we, 
it's only when you get into nature that you realize there are a lot of alien plants uh, in South Africa that shouldn't be there. And the top one that I hate the most uh, because it creates the most damage um, is the jointed cactus. It's an absolute nightmare. And so that one, we've been working five years on it. Uh, two kilometers above Red House to right down to John Talent, uh, all along the riverbanks, around the Swatcock Police Station, the horse field, everywhere. It was infesting everywhere. It's taken us five years, but I think we've done about 95% eradication. You can't throw it in landfill because it just grows again. You can't burn it. So uh, we have a very friendly, helpful EnviroServe um, who take it from us. When we have about 40 or 50 bags, they take it and they bury it in their landfill, in their landfill site. Um, they even put uh, lime over it to make sure that it dies. Um, that just gives you some idea. All right. Uh, getting into some lighter vein here. This is a photograph of some of our litter team. Um, I didn't take a very good photograph, but you can see the uh, aluminium boat, 5.3 meter boat in the background. This is on the banks of the Swatkops estuary, about two kilometers up from Red House towards Utenay, and we were collecting litter there. We collect litter the entire 16 kilometer estuary, uh, right from the Settlers Bridge, in fact, from the beach right to Perseverance, where the fresh water meets the salt water. We clicked right up there. And we've got two boats, one stationed in, in uh, Red House, the older one. This is the old one, Curlew, it's about 12 years old. Fantastic boat. And the other one, the new one, I got sponsorship last year. We got it in April last year. It's stationed in uh, Swatkops at uh, Tiger Bay. And a very helpful uh, fellow in the uh, metro, uh, Carl Gilkmuth, he skippers that one and he collects he collects the plastic lower down. So the way we do plastics off the estuary is we collect at low tide. We collect the, the litter team collects at low tide and the bags um, are collected by the boat at high tide. Uh, because uh, you can imagine how difficult it is to take the plastic bags off the banks across muddy banks. Sometimes you have to your knees and you can't get to the boat. So we we pick up plastic bags at high tide with the bags. Um, let's get to the next slide. That's the new boat I was alluding to. In the background, you can see Swatkop's village and Strand, the Strand. Um, right there in the background is Tiger Bay, uh, where the boat is housed. That's, this is a fantastic boat, 4.3 meter aluminum hull boat, 50 or Suzuki, and it zips along at 45, 50 k's an hour. Take six people, fantastic. And it'll take about 45 bags of litter. Problem with the litter that we pick off the S3 banks, it is so muddy and slimy and dirty um, that we've basically been asked by the recycle people not to supply plastic that's so uh, polluted. So we basically, whatever we pick up on the, on the S3 banks, basically goes straight to landfill. We used to try and split it and try and wash it, but it's just too difficult. So stuff that we pick up alongside the road that's recyclable, we use that because it's relatively clean. But once it's in the river, uh, and our river on occasions is highly polluted, so it's, you can't recycle that. This is our older boat, Curlew. It stays, it's housed in uh, Red House. We've got two, two skippers, I call them drivers. Uh, one's only 84 years old. One driver, and he still carries on. Um, he loves his boat and he drives it very well. The other guy, Rod, uh, is a bit younger than that. So you can see this boat is loaded. If it's fully loaded, it'll take about 70 bags, but then you've only got the skipper and nobody else. Um, we, one may ask, where do we take the bags? Um, there's a place at Corrobrick, which is the, if you know, on the old Grahamstown Road, there's a brick factory. Uh, and there's a place where, they, where the trucks turn there. Alongside of it, we've got a place agreed with the municipal truck. We will take, we will offload the bags at Corrobrick and I'll just uh, phone them and they come along fairly soon after that and pick it up. So fantastic working arrangement. Especially when I tell them there's 100 bags or 140 bags or 200 bags there, they come running. 
and it works very well. Uh, sometimes there's so much litter, uh, and you may ask, where does the litter come from? Normally happens after rain. Uh, you find the stormwater drains bring the, uh, the litter down the stormwater drains. By the way, stormwater canal is our biggest headache. Um, it drains 60 kilometers of stormwater drains out of Motherwell. And the amount of litter around there just comes flooding down with a big, big rain. Uh, our record is on January the 5th, 19, 2017, sorry, not <laughs> 2017, there was a cloudburst in Motherwell. And we spent two weeks collecting 970 bags of litter within a kilometer of the of the exit point of the Motherwell Canal. I thought I could walk across the river, actually. That's my record. But normally, the normal equation is 10 millimeters of rain gives you approximately 100 bags. So you know when, when it rains, I know I've got to go to the Motherwell Canal area and collect bags. Um, and you may well ask, well, why, why are we having to collect the stuff down there? Surely we should catch it higher up. Uh, we tried, we, uh, the municipality put in three litter traps, three big metal litter traps, and they have to be made very strong, very heavy, because you will find that you get there the next day, it's stolen. So unless you make something so heavy and so strong, uh, it's gone. We've tried fences, jaguar proof fences, you know, uh, uh, fencing uh, fences at the bottom of the Motherwell Canal. One minute it's there and the next minute it's gone. I guess some pig star or hawk has got it. So it's easy to talk, but very difficult to do. Um, we've tried putting we've tried putting floating booms at the bottom there. Only trouble is if you get a 30, 40 mile, mile an hour gale, the plastic stays inside the boom on the river. You get a 40, 40 mile an hour gale, it blows the entire lot over the boom into the river. So we spent 4,000 rand on a boom for nothing. Just giving you some, some of the ideas. Back to the three litter traps, they don't work very well. It was opening upstream for the litter to come in and then be trapped in this uh, uh, lattice work, metal work, uh, made up of metal bars only. Um, but when plastic piles up in there, it forms a impenetrable wall almost. So the water rises. So when the truck came down to lift the um, the litter trap out the water. About 40 bags worth of litter trapped inside all went out, or about eight bags. Mm -hmm. Then the railers made a serious problem. So now, right now, we've got our first litter trap, we're putting a gate on it. So when we put it in the water empty, we'll open the gate. So before we lift the litter trap out, we'll close the gate so all the plastic doesn't float out. But that's serious. We're still in that process. That cost us. That will cost us about 78,000 Rand to do. Uh, we've got a very friendly donor uh, helping us. Municipal property, but we're spending lots of conservancy donor money on trying to uh, improve the situation in the river. We have to. The metro is bankrupt. All right, I'll go to the next screen. Um, at least once a month or at least quarterly, uh, we participate in beach cleanups, especially along Blue Water Bay Beach. And I must remind everybody that uh, hasn't been on Blue Water Bay Beach, that beach is long. It's five kilometers long. Uh, and across the, the Swatkops estuary is New Brighton Beach. So we've got about six kilometers of beach to clean up. Um, and this year, one of our friendly Swatkops Conservancy members, um, who belongs to the Life Saving Club, has used an old life-saving lifeboat um, to collect litter in it. You'll see inside there those yellow blags um, or some of the litter collected on one of the, we normally do it on a Saturday morning. We collect for an hour, hour and a half, 60, 80. I think the top one we ever got on a Saturday was 160 bags. Last Saturday we did 66 on Blue Water Bay Beach. We did a section. Um, so we try and help on the beach as well. Uh, it's a never ending. Why do people litter? Uh, which we can answer the question. I'm sure SST would like an answer to the question. We certainly haven't got the answer. Um, but I just want to share with you uh, I spend a lot of time in Motherwell in some of the disadvantaged areas in the township. And the younger generation have grown up in living in plastic. To them, it's the norm, it's not the abnormal. 
So, and they see their superiors and friends and all that also throwing plastic away. So to them, it's the normal thing to do. You eat something and the empty bottle is no value to them, so they just throw it away. The problem is plastic, once the contents are consumed, there's no value to anybody. And that's the issue, in my opinion. But how to convince somebody in disadvantaged areas not to litter when they've grown up in litter, um, that's a subject for a PhD uh, dissertation, I think. I haven't got the answer, but just sharing. There are many other reasons. Uh, one of them being we're creating work. Um, we're a bit thin with me, but anyway. Uh, and in the last six years, I've been up and down the river talking to as many fishermen as I can. And people who know me know me that I, <laughs> I love talking to people. I love it. Uh, and I've never met one fisherman yet who actually admits to littering. Hey, this new money, it's somebody else. It's not me. I take my stuff home. I don't litter. I put it in bins. I said, well, there's no bins around here. So you, obviously, you must take it home. You, of course, we do. They all litter. Uh, there might be the odd exception. Um, so those are the two sources. It's stormwater canals, people littering um, up in the townships or anywhere, and then fishermen, mainly fishermen. Uh, you can see when fishermen are there. There's beer bottles, there's gin bottles, and it's um, uh, two liter Coke bottles with a side cut out which had prawns in it, or sometimes there's prawns still in it all dead. Um, fishermen leave a fingerprint. You can soon see who's been littering. It's a fisherman or a picnicker, um, or it's come down from, from a stormwater canal somewhere. Uh, the third sector that, that does annoy me, does worry me, is the car just opens the window or the taxi opens the window and it gets thrown out the window. And you say, oi, what are you doing that for? Uh, and you can see the look at you just to say, well, everybody does it. I'm just challenging everybody. Not easy. I haven't got the answer. I'll go on to the next slide. Just thought I'd show you, uh, when I say the estuary banks are littered, I mean littered. And if you look at those bottles there, plastic bottles, they are absolutely filthy. They're filthy with, with um, the Motherwell Stormwater Canal um, and the Markman Canal and the Chatty River. They all run into the estuary. And most of them often um, are running sewage. The Markman Canal sometimes runs industrial sewage as well. But Motherwell, it's sewage and water and water leaks. Uh, same thing with Chatty River, which comes in just above the Swatkov's Bridge. It runs sewage. And it's a long river and it's polluting almost nonstop. Uh, when you test there, you get about 2,000 uh, particles of E. coli per 100 mil. Uh, the Motherwell Canal is a disaster. You get 400,000. A little bit of good news about the Motherwell Canal. Um, October 9 last year, we diverted the flow of the Motherwell Canal, which runs at about 9 million liters per day, 9 megaliters per day on average. And it's mostly polluted, partly polluted with sewage. There's three things in there. Sewage, uh, water leaks, and uh, underground fountains. Uh, so, and that when it runs into the uh, estuary is the main reason why the Red House River Mile was cancelled because when the tide comes in that mother of pollution goes right up to Red House and about a couple hundred meters past that the tidal drift of the mother canal is about possibly a, a kilometer above Red House to about where the Swatkos Bridge is that's the tidal drift of the of the mother canal the Markman canal is probably nearly a kilometer uh, seaside of the mother canal the tidal drift is probably up nearly to Red House, maybe not quite, and through to Swatkov's village, in front of Swatkov's village. That's about the tidal drift. So back to this um, photograph here, a picture of the pollution, the plastic. You can't recycle that, so we just put it in bags uh, at low tide, and the boat comes along at high tide and picks it up. Um, and you, you get that for hundreds of meters. Um, Typically, we'll, we'll pick up after 20 millimeters of rain, we'll pick up 200 bags, 240 bags, 190 bags. Um, it sort of averages out at 100 bags per 10 millimeters of rain. Uh, then we range right up and down the Swatkops River. Uh, but we go for the biggest pollution first, 
and then and then we work our way uh, up and down the river until we eventually we clean the whole river. And bet your whoopsie. And bet your bottom dollar. The day after we've said we just finished cleaning 16 kilometers of the river. Guess what? It blew all rains again. So there's a few swear words, and then we start all over again. Um, anyway, we don't give up. Our little team of four, two of the ladies started litter collecting in about nine, uh, 2012, about 10 years ago. Right, so there's two ladies and there's two men, two young lads. Um, they've been doing it for two or three years. Uh, used to be four ladies, but the other two have re since retired. Um, and then we need our boats, but sometimes on the western banks of the uh, Swartops estuary, uh, you can't get there except by boat. So we come to the east bank, we get collected by boat there and taken across. And then four hours later, picked up and the bags and deposited at Corabri. So that's our central rendezvous point. If we're higher up at Red House, then Bennett Street in Red House is our rendezvous point there. We go right up to, if anybody knows it, to the power lines and we collect over there. Uh, about a year or two ago, this old man and a young lad I uh, volunteered to go with the boat to collect one day. Well, we got 28 bags of litter. I got three. And uh, Casey got 25 bags. I was so proud of him. When I got back, I was knackered. Um, I don't know what he felt like, but he was used to it. And I think I'm about four times older than him. All right. <clears throat> a lot of people um, in Amsterdam Hook and Red House help us. Pro bono. There's no involved, they are concerned residents. This is from last Saturday. Um, and the driver of that vehicle, that Land Rover, is Louis Bayes. He stays in Amsterdam. A good friend of ours, good supporter of the SWAT Conservancy. That's his wife in the back there. Um, and they collected the 33 bags off, uh, off, the, off the sea, off the seashore. Uh, we did a, a, a sea collection along the, along the beach behind Wells Estate, if you know where that is. Which is about midpoint along Blue Water Bay Beach. Jenny Rum said, We haven't touched that, let's go and do it. So we did that on, on Saturday morning in conjunction with WESA, Wetland Society of South Africa. Uh, and, and closer to, to the parking bay, we got, <clears throat> funnily enough, the same 33 bags as the 33 bags collected off the beach. But the beach collection was plastic. The 33 bags we collected close to the uh, Wells Estate, what we call the uh, the, the, uh, the, brick, the big brick monolith there and the parking area is broken glass. Wells Estate is renowned for the, that type of customer who comes along there or spectator or see uh, whatever you like to call the people. They come along there and they drink and then they, the idea is to smash the bottle afterwards. So you spend hours picking up smashed glass uh, and then somebody cut, cut their ankle on a piece of glass. But we picked up mostly 33 bags of glass. So with glass, you learn not to swing the bag backwards and forwards because there'll be a glass shard sticking out and it cut your calf, which is what happened to him. You only get cut once. So that's what we did on Saturday. And every time we have a beach cleanup, Louis with his four by four or other people, we get three or four, depending on, on the size of the beach cleanup, uh, uh, they all come and help. Because believe me, carrying a heavy bag over 200 meters of sand dunes into the car park is not funny. Uh, really isn't funny. So we get permission from the metro to drive on the beach with our 4x4s four and they're quite good about that. In fact, sometimes they come and help us as well with their vehicle. All right. I was telling you about recycling. Uh, this is a year or two ago. Uh, the skipper on the left-hand side, he's only 84 years old now, but he's as fit as a fiddle. Um, and the one on the right here, the young lad on the right is my grandson, Andrew, with his two friends. They came and picked up a pile of what we tried to separate what we picked up on the riverbanks. Not so muddy. You know, they picked up in the grass and the reeds and all that type of dirt for recycling purposes. Uh, but we proved that it's just too onerous. But this time we did. We picked up, I think it's 43 bait. Um, and then we take it off the boat, load my trailer up, and we take it to our recycling center to get uh, further uh, uh, sorted. Um, 
and it's quite it works quite well but we basically had to give that up uh, with most of the stuff that's recyclable is so polluted you can't use it all right and that that boat is the old boat curly which can take 70 bags but then you, you can hardly see the driver nobody else can sit on the boat remember i was telling you about coral brick um this is a central point like halfway up the estuary it's about eight kilometers up from the sea mouth and from the top of the river and we tend to bring all our bags and offload them here and the metro comes and collects it so this is us offloading that's my caddy over there and that's our 2.4 meter light duty trailer it holds about 50 bags and if you drive too fast the bag blows off so you've got to tie it down with a net we offload there our phone our phone no no at the uh, Motherwell uh, cleansing department, and she sends a truck down to collect it. There's normally a truck collecting somewhere, so you just redirect them. Yeah, works very well. One of our few successes. Um, I think there was 141 people in this. This is another photograph of a beach cleanup before we started. I think. I think over there you can see Auntie Jenny, my fellow worker. She's talking. That's her husband Arthur behind there. Um, I think there was 140 people. We might have got 160 bags this time, but we spread out left and right and we collect. Um, feel quite satisfied. If it gets a bit disheartening, you go back a week later and you wonder, did you do anything? Um, we don't understand why fishermen litter, they say they don't, and why people buy the fast food takeaways up here, go to the beach and start polystyrene all over the place, wine bottles. Uh, Bread packets, hey, cool drink bottles, you name it. You just, you can't stop, you must just carry on. Right. Um, <clears throat> remember, I told you we have a, an education program. Uh, Jenny Rump runs this, yeah. We try, and, we try and take one class of all about six, 70 pupils from each school. There's 32 schools. In fact, we're targeting 41 this year from Kwasakele, um, Wells Estate, and Motherwell, and Swartcourt Primary, and Red House Primary. We're talking in 41 schools. Once a week on a Wednesday, we take one school um, to educate them on the estuary and at the Markman Canal about pollution. But part of that spin-off is um, Patricia, our lead teacher, and that's her son there, um, she's got a group of those kids that show uh, much enthusiasm about protecting the environment. So she's got an Enviro Club, and every Saturday, almost every Saturday, if the weather permits, they go and do uh, something to do with the environment. Whether they're planting speck worm, um, this last Saturday they collected something like 160 bags, but I think there's more than 50 of them. But the school children, it's not just from one school, there's three or four from this school, it's those ones that show the most interest. She's got their phone numbers, and Patricia does it. So there are little green shoots spreading out all away and all around in the township. Uh, this is my favorite. This is our youngest litter picker. She's my favorite. Um, very nice young lady. Um, so this is you can't see um, you can't see it, but this bridge here spans the Motherwell Canal, which goes from the east side of eastern boundary of Motherwell down past the EnviroServe, that's the EnviroServe mountain there, uh, and the Swatkops River is down, down the escarpment. Um, that uh, Motherwell uh, Stormwater Canal is about 4.7 kilometers long. Cement line, so what happens up 4.7 kilometers up top there, if it rains there, you guarantee an hour later, the water and the plastic and the, whatever pollution there is, is in the river. Badly designed, everybody admits it now, but that this Motherwell Stormwater Canal was built in the seven, late 70s, early 80s. Um, and it's never stopped running water since it was constructed. Um, combination of fountain water and water leaks. And lately, the water leaks have increased to the point where we run between 9 and 12 million liters per day. Um, as I said before, we've, we've blanked off that, um, we've diverted the Motherwell Canal flow Instead of going into the river, we've connected, uh, diverted it through a reed bed, then dug a 297 mil, mil, uh, meter channel, two meters wide and a meter deep, 
into a disused salt pan, 70 hectare salt pan. So all the Motherwell Canal polluted water is running in there. So the, uh, the estuary is that much cleaner. But now it leaves us with other two headaches, the Markman Canal and uh, Chatty River. So we're still working on that. Uh, what we do want to do is we want to talk to the residents along the Motherwell Canal. And we want to ask them to, to help us um, rather recycle and uh, take the stuff, the refuse that they often throw on the banks of the Motherwell Canal. Uh, I've seen an old lady running along there with a wheelie bin and actually wheel it and throw it in the, uh, in the Motherwell Canal. So I said to her, Mama, when's I doing? Sorry, I can speak close, I'm bilingual. Um, I said, why do you do that? So she said, if we leave our wheelie bins out overnight to be collected by the metro, there's no guarantee that the wheelie bin will still be there in the morning. In any case, my house is only 20 meters from the Motherwell Canal, and I've got 100 meters to push the wheelie bin. What do you think? I said, Mama, I agree with you entirely. What, is, what was I supposed to say? So those are all the logistical reasons. So there's a lot of that. The houses alongside the Motherwell Canal, there's a 20 meter gap of open drop. So if for some reason the metro doesn't collect rubbish, the bin's full. They empty it out on the banks of the Motherwell Canal. And it's hard to argue that. Dale, uh, I see yes. we, we are running out of time slightly. Do you want to move Ooh. ahead to the, the tables that do. you have I will do. with some of the stats? Um, I'm not, I don't usually talk so much. I don't know why. <laughs> now, why is it not moving along? Uh, this is just a shot up, up in Newton Egg. You think, you think the P or Kubeja has got uh, pollution. Newton Egg is just, or Kareja is just as bad, even worse. Um, <clears throat> I've kept stats. Since 2017, I've kept stats of all the litter that we picked up. Um, uh, in six years, since 2017, we picked up 64,000 bags. Um, 64,000, yeah. 53,756 at the end of January 2023. Um, just want to take you through a couple of interesting things. We mostly had four employees. We mostly worked a five day week. Um, but you'll see there we get to about July 2019. We never worked July and August. Reason being, the Metro stopped paying us again. Uh, they stopped in 2015. Um, SPA kindly sponsored us from 2016 onwards, from mid-2016. We didn't collect for six months. And then I started stats in 2017. They sponsored us to a certain extent, and the Metro paid the balance, and then ran out of funds. So we couldn't work for those two months. And then, and then we basically, since then, the Metro hasn't paid us since then. We've relied on local sponsors, private sponsors, especially SPA. So we've, we've reduced from a five five-man team to a four-man team, and we reduced to a four-day week, two-day week, four-day week, uh, all the way through. Um, you'll find in 2020, remember, March 2020, all of a sudden COVID hit us, and we stopped from March 26 and we resumed on May 5. We couldn't sit still at home and do nothing, so I just put my head down, and we resumed litter picking from then on. Um, um, and there's various other comments. Uh, we've often stopped and done recycling. Uh, we've done, if you look at my uh, point here, squatter removal in 2022. Uh, uh, the two months prior to that, we spent six days removing aliens. This is agaves, uh, then squatter removals, and another two days. Okay. Sorry, I uh, thought I switched my phone off. Anyway, all right. Uh, thanks, thanks, Dale. Um, I see we, right. we we do have a question that's come through so far. Um, but thank you, Dale, for sharing that with us. I all know right. you guys do a, a wide range of work from the water testing right. to the collecting and um, 
and establishing the reed bends with the Motherwell canals. Um, okay. So there have been one or two comments uh, that have come through in the chat box that say it's sad but interesting to hear the similar challenges being faced in both the Swat Corps estuary and in the rivers in Durban. Um, and then a comment saying, uh, well done, Dale, and the Swat Corps Conservancy for the amazing work. It must be so physically and emotionally, emotionally draining. Um, and uh, they hope that it improves. Uh, we you. do have a question that's come through in the Q&A box um, that says, in some countries, municipalities have been sued for not providing a clean and healthy environment. Would something similar work in Klebeche and South Africa in general? I don't know we, if you want to comment a, on that. I, I, we have a legal case lodged with the Metro right now. Not only, it's about pollution in general, mainly targeting Suri, but it's pollution in general. We've, loved, we've got so, you know, so concerned about the lack of service delivery that we've actually lodged a legal uh, case against the Metro. It's in process. We hope we will have a response and some action. Okay. Uh, that's that's very interesting Interesting to, to know that that is in the works. Um, uh, I wonder, Dale, could you comment at all about any fluctuations in the amount of waste that you've been collecting? I know you said that it obviously it averages about 60 bags a day, which is... Yeah. A very large amount, um, but in terms of uh, any various upstream um, interventions that have been launched, has anything had an impact on that? Yeah, you know, um, I've noticed that we used to collect at about 60 bags a day. We average around about 45 now. Um, so we we think, um, and I'm reassuring Spa as well. Is our is our education? Is our collecting? Is my talking? Is it having some sort of impact? impact I, we think it has but it's not enough you just keep, you have to keep on going so it's a long process there's no there's no magic bullet to stop plastic pollution tomorrow it's a long process and different prongs different attacks are required yes it's gone down from 60 bags a day in our uh, uh, area uh, estuary area down to about 45 bags a day not for lack of drying it has come down but you we we would love to get it down to 30 bags a day, 20 bags a day. Yes, um, I, I hear what you're saying. That's 45 bags a day is still quite a bit, but that, that is a remarkable improvement. Um, yeah. uh, I see there's another yeah. question here saying, have you managed to look at which producers' products are the most common when collecting waste? I don't know if you do any audits yeah. or any data collection yeah. with the bags. It's, it's that favorite beverage in a two liter bottle. Uh, <laughs> uh, dear, oh dear, poor old Coke. Uh, and then the fast foods right drives us mad the fast foods uh the polystyrene those things there i wish we could ban that single use that single use stuff should be banned uh, especially that styrofoam polystyrene all that stuff the other one that drives me mad is guess what kimbies babies nappies have you ever picked up babies naps sodden babies nappies out of the estuary that have been washed down it is not very nice it is most disgusting. And I'm sure that obviously contributes to contaminating the recycling and reducing the, the possibilities yeah, there. There's, there's just too much sewage coming down. You can't you can't use that that plastic. It's too dirty. Mm. And we go through liters and liters of sanitizer. You have no idea. We spray each other. Um, you have to wash and spray and use gloves and gum boots and all the protective measures that you can. Mm. So far we seem to have escaped major diseases. That's that's wonderful. I'm glad to hear that everyone has, has made it through unscathed for yeah. the time being. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, there's there been a comment saying it seems to be this, uh, similar kinds of waste that are found in Durban as well. Um, yeah. And definitely uh, a, a valuable information for extended producer responsibility. There, yeah. Then there was another comment saying, thank you for all the work you do, Dale. And yeah. uh, another question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah, just to, to echo those sentiments, I think um, yeah, it sounds like you're keeping an astronomical amount of waste out of um, preventing it from entering the, the rivers, um, sorry, yeah. prevent it, preventing the it from entering the seas um, and yeah. washing up along the way and everything. So those 60 bags that you've been collecting for, for six years make a huge difference. Um, oh. And then there's a, a similar question saying what kinds of plastic are most common, which you, you partly answered. And then the second part of the question is referring to what are the most interesting and strange things that you've found? Uh, strange things, interesting things. Um, we bury a lot of dead dogs. Okay. Dead dogs get thrown into the Motherwell Canal, get rain, and they float down to the bottom. Nobody buries them. So we've got quite a process game. We've got forks and spades and picks, 
And when that happens, we drag, we drag the poor dog's carcass up above the high water mark, take a big hole, and we bury it there. So um, we've done about pro probably half a dozen in the last two years. Uh, I just can't handle poor dogs lying there. And they're polluting the river. Uh, so we drag them out the sure. river um, and bury them. I see. Um, that that the definitely other, see. Go on. The other, the other strange things we get, the river is polluted. And I tell the poor people, but there's people that, uh, that pray in the river, you know, the, to the gods and the spirits and things like that. I said, people, this river is polluted. They say, never mind, our ancestors this way, did this, and they will go in the river as well. They still seem to be alive. I don't know how, but they go into thoroughly polluted estuary to pray to, they wash and do all sorts of things. And I, I just cringe when, when it happens. We try our best to educate them, but they don't want to listen. Uh, I see. And Dale, can you comment at all? Obviously, the river is used for, for multiple different purposes, but just in terms of yeah. scale for those who won't have seen it or who, who aren't um, who aren't local, is the Swartkops estuary the largest body of water um, right. putting water into yeah. the, it, sorry, within Klebecha and the surroundings? Yeah. Is that the largest yeah. body of water it going into the, the ocean? the largest body of water. What I've noticed since 2015, the drought in this area, as it, it means that the three sewage works upstream near Butne, Tarecha, Dispatch, Kwanabusle, uh, those three cities work. They probably contribute 80% to the liquid that comes down the river and enters the estuary. And those three cities works are not exactly, um, and you can speak to the university, they say the uh, the water treated is, uh, is not satisfactory, it's below par. So we're having polluted water being Put into the river, so it's resulted in an absolute escalation of of the um, water hyacinth. When you see water hyacinth, you must know there's a lot of nutrients there. Pollution, it's poo. Um, and when it proliferates, you must know there's a lot of food in the river. So from Utnag right down to Perseverance, where it enters the saltwater estuary, it's almost totally choked with water hyacinth. Now, when we test the outlet. Um, of the sewage works in Utene, which is called the um, Kelvin Jones sewage work, you get a 400,000 rand, 400,000 pieces of poop per hundred mil. When you test at the at the causeway where it runs into the saltwater estuary, you get 250. That water hyacinth is doing a fantastic job without term chewing the poop. It eats up all the almost all the nutrients. The only problem happens when you get a cloud burst in Utene. 50 mils in half an hour. Then you get a torrent of water, and the poor old hyacinth has got no chance. So it pushes some of the hyacinths into the salt water estuary where it died, but it pushes the untreated sewage into the top end of the estuary. Then you get a huge half algal bloom, adding to whatever Markman Canal and Chatty River is pumping into the middle. When that happens, the entire river goes into an algal bloom. And then all the fish come to the top, and the fish is the pelicans and whatever, the seagulls have a great time feeding on all the fish coming to the surface, including little souls. There's no idea, hundreds and thousands of them. I see, it's quite the quite the knock-on effect. Um, yep. Yeah, so I, I see that we are slightly over time, but if anyone right. does have any further questions after today's session or perhaps watching the recording, um, you're welcome to email those through to webinars at sccafrica.org.za and we'll, we'll happily pass those along to Dale. Um, for now, to close off, thank you so much, everyone, for for joining us, and thank you, thank you, Dale, for taking the time to present for Pleasure. us today. Pleasure. I know, I know, you and Jenny and the whole team are incredibly busy with the various <laughs> with the various projects that you're involved with. Um, so we really appreciate you taking the time to to share some of the amazing and tireless work that you've been doing over the last um, years and decades. Um, so thank, thank you, you, Dale. Thank you, Dara. We enjoy okay. it. We never we never give up. Okay, I'm I'm glad, and it definitely sounds like. Uh, it, the trends are going in the right direction, at least, yeah, even if yeah. 45 bags is still a, lo a long way to go, at least it's a step in the right yeah. direction. Um, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you, everyone. Um, we will have another webinar next week um, with a few, uh, with two speakers joining us from Green Corridors in Durban, speaking on waste material collection and the beneficiation program. Um, so please join us for that. Uh, and in the meantime, um, thank you so much, everyone, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. Bye-bye. Bye now.